We acknowledge that this event is taking place upon the traditional territories, the territories of the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations Confederacy, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, and before them, the Chinantan Nation, called the Neutral by the French and the Attawandaran by the surrounding nations. These people are the original caretakers, the peoples that lived on and intimately worked with these lands. We acknowledge that we have a responsibility to know and understand their heritage. The treaty that was signed for this territory is the Between the Lakes Treaty Number no. 3 of 1792, and further the deed referred to as the Haldeman Proclamation of 1784, which applies to the land six miles on either side of the Grand River, from the mouth to its source. We need to be aware of our role in these documents. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples upon this land. We acknowledge that we have an obligation to learn to live wisely together on this land. Um, first of all, uh, before I begin this presentation uh, of this gentleman, I'd like to uh, acknowledge one of our directors, Julia Jacobson, uh, she researched the, the genealogical part of this, uh, this gentleman. When I asked, uh, I said, I'd like to do a presentation on, on Harold Albert Light. And so she started the, uh, the genealogical study. And it ended up being 66 pages she's got on that. And the family was entirely grateful, found out a lot of things they didn't know. And, and um, the, the presentation, uh, when she started, ended up doing such a concise record that uh, the, the family is just thrilled. And uh, many of the words here that I'm going to say tonight are, have come out of that uh, genealogical study that, uh, that Julia did. The picture you see in front of you is Harold Albert White. He's the son of a Baptist minister, a World War I fighter pilot, which is a rare breed. You see over on, on against the wall right here is the type of uniform he would have worn. That uniform is about 100 and almost 107 years old and has survived. And that's what they would have worn. They would have been small men because they had to fit in a cockpit. And, uh, and these planes up there, uh, as you see over top, are exact replicas of World War I fighter planes that they would have flown in back then. Um, in 2021, Canadian Military Heritage Museum was honored to welcome a family who had traveled from British Columbia and Sarnia to donate some important pieces of their family's heritage. Um, granddaughter Lynn White Batchelor is on the is in the middle. Her husband Tim Stevens and daughter-in-law uh, Carol White McKay presented the museum with the artifacts of Captain Harold Albert White. And uh, the first thing is, is uh, that's the entire collection. Uh, the next one is, is ID bracelet. This ID bracelet is a real interesting one. A lot of the officers wore these. They were probably given these before they left. And, and the interesting thing about this, and I'm sorry I did, it's the same on both sides, but on the back of it, it's got his address on it, 546 Colbert Street. 546 Colbert Street right now, I'll mention that later, but 546 Colburn Street is across from the old um, uh, Canadian Tire. It's the uh, Shoppers Drug Mart on Colburn Street. It's a big red brick wall now where their house used to be. Um, it's RAF wings. That's, these are the original wings that we were gratefully accepted. And that's what Harold Albert White would have worn and is the box that held the Distinguished Flying Cross. And, and mostly, and especially, is this World War I Distinguished Flying Cross. That is the front. It's got the uh, King George V cipher on it. And, uh, and the date, 1918, is on the back. And it says RAF on the front, but it's a very rare artifact to a former Brantford resident and a World War I fighter pilot this will be given a place of honor in our uh, displays, and we'll do a, a real focus. It'll be a focus point in the in the museum. And as DFC, it, it's so rare uh, to, especially to a Bradford resident, uh, we were thrilled to receive it. We do we did not even have a World War II distinguished flying cross. And just to put this into perspective, 
In World War I, there were 193 distinguished flying crosses presented to Canadians in the RAF and the Royal Flying Corps. And in World War II, there was 4,000. And, uh, and of course, in World War II, there's a lot more planes flying, but in, in, in uh, 247 in Korea. But it, it was really significant to have received one of these in World War I. Um, Harold Albert White was born on February 14th, Valentine's Day, 1896, in Stockholm, Sussex, England. His father was the Reverend White. He valued the importance of the Bible and its value in raising and guiding his children. Harold Albert White was brought up in a very strict Baptist family. He was surrounded by his two brothers and his sister, Emily. It's believed that in 1911, uh, Reverend White was invited to attend the uh, Onondaga Baptist Church, Bradford Brent, as their pastor, and he accepted this offer. And he and the family eventually immigrated to Canada from England, settling in Bradford. The exact home is unknown, but by 1913, the family was now residing in Bramford at 175 Drummond Street. And the home was a two-story brick house, and no, it's no longer there. And uh, uh, they, they eventually moved into a, uh, took ownership of 546 Coleman Street. That's the one I mentioned, which is down uh, by the Shoppers Drug Mart, where it is now. Uh, the White family remained on, at the Colburn Street House from 1915 to 1924, and during part of this period, Reverend White held the pastor at Onondaga Baptist Church, Grant County. And at early, as early as 15 years of age, Harold Albert was employed by the Kerr Goodwin Machinery Company as a machinist and held this position until his uh, enlistment in the military in 1917. The company at that time was located at 256 Colburn Street, and that's the corner of Market and Colburn, and the original building is long since gone, and it's now the Grand River Hall opposite the library. So during the war years, in 1915, Harold's brothers, Sidney and Stanley, oh, they were also employed in Brantford, one was in the CPR telephone company, and Stanley was a clerk at the Royal Bank. And his sister Emily would still have been in school and uh, too young to be working at that point. We get to 1917, and Brother Sidney is still at home, but he's now working for the Brentford Blue Company. And I don't know whether you remember the Brentford Blue or the Blue <laughs> Company on the bottom of Locks Road. And then you'd see down there there'd be all those horse hides hanging on the fence down there, and it smelled awful. Yeah. And uh, Stanley is still at home, and he's a shell inspector. And he's, he's working at most, uh, which a lot of the industries did during the war, they uh, switched over, like Massey's and Cockshits, switched over from farm implements to, uh, to uh, production of wartime products. At the outbreak of World War I, Canada did not have a very robust military. Its aviation corps consisted of three people, and one Burgess Bent aircraft that was eventually deemed unsuitable for combat. Of the three aviators that arrived in England, only two joined the British Royal Flying Corps. And pilot training in the early days was rudimentary, and although by the end of the war, young pilots were reporting to squadrons with between 20 to 30, 20, between 30 to 50 hours of experience in the air, and it's not unusual for some of them to have only 9 to 10 hours of experience before they got in the air. Up to 1917, the life expectancy of a new pilot in combat was 20 minutes, which resulted in the dark humor of pilots referring to themselves as members of the 20-minute club. And uh, remember, at the onset of World War I, aircraft combat was in its infancy, and it had only been 11 years prior that the Wright brothers had flown and invented and flew the first successful flight in 19, oh, uh, 1903 that was and the first that was the first powered flight in Canada was 1909 so in 1914 you've got young guys flying big planes like this and when they were first up there there's somebody could sit in the back seat and they would take up a shotgun or a pistol and and you'd be shooting in close quarters but uh, you know these these were young guys looking for adventure and I think once they got up there they probably might have regretted it so by, 19, uh, by 
1917, the aviation training uh, had been ramped up, and the British Royal Flying Corps came to Canada to establish the Royal Flying Corps of Canada. Britain was experiencing a great loss of aviator, aviators at this time, and had limited replacement men. So the Earth's RFC, which is the Royal Flying Corps, looked at Canada to take advantage of the available pool of uh, aviators. This is a picture of, uh, of, of Harold White as a cadet. And there is a picture, this is an interesting scenario because uh, Julia Jacobson, the one that did the, uh, the genealogical part of it, she found a program that, that colorized these pictures. <coughs> so some of the, and, and there's a great controversy in colorizing uh, artifacts, but for, the, uh, for this, she, uh, she did a great job. So some of them she took the original, corrected it, enhanced it, and did uh, color pictures. And some of them came out pretty good and it gives you a better idea of the actual colors of it at the time. So in, in 1917 March, uh, the cadet wing of the Royal Flying Corps was officially established at the University of Toronto. And Harold enlisted with the Royal Flying Corps on the 20th of July, 1917. And his aviation uh, training commenced. This, he was 21 years, five months of age, as you can see. The attestation papers are what everybody signed. Everybody had to sign. Um, in, the, in the Army, it was a lot different because you signed a lot more detailed things that give your age and your... And so that's that's the front page, and this is the back page. And there, this is uh, Library and Archives Canada if you want to do research on the First World War. This is where you get your research, uh, and it, everything is there from medical records to uh, pay records, and anybody doing research on the First World War, that's where you want to go. Library and Archives Canada, and uh, Great War Centenary Association has always been, been uh, a benefit to all my research also. That's the uh, First War. So in March uh, 1917, the largest flying schools established at uh, Camp Gordon where Harold mostly, most likely obtained his flying training. And the flight training was truly hands-on as the instru instructors, uh, they would show over the roar of the engine because they had no radios at this time until the microphones had come in later. He was training for 130 days or approximately four and a half months before he was deemed ready for engagement, which is quite long for, for, for training at that point. Between September and November of two, uh, 1917, Harold completed the last leg of his training, and on November 26th, he was discharged from training as a second lieutenant and transferred to England on the 18th of December, 1917. So we're, we're heading into the last year, really, of the war, and he eventually joined Squadron 90 at Shorewood, and then he was transferred to Squadron 23. Now this is Squadron 23, and that's the plane that they trained on and flew. And this picture is, uh, there's the group. This is what, uh, one of those pictures that Julia has done the, uh, the colorizing us. And it, and it does give you a, a, a better idea. She corrected the, the picture, enhanced it, and it shows you some of the colors of the camouflage that's on those planes that they used back then. Really primitive. Uh, machine guns up top, and uh, and the uh, rate of casualties was very high for anybody <coughs> in the uh, fighter squadrons. It's only fair to mention that the aircraft of World War I were far from today's technology and structure, and, and structure, and it consisted of wood, canvas, and and wire, which is exactly what these are exact replicas. This is a, a wood frame with stretched canvas over top. And these are uh, three German planes and the plane on the, uh, the other side. Newport was one that something like Billy, Bush, Billy Bishop would have flown. And this plane, the Falls plane right here over top of you, is exact replica of one that Harold White shot down. That was one of his planes that he shot down in 1918. Uh, flight suits were designed to, for warmth and uh, as cockpits were completely open, and coveralls would go over the uniforms with pilots bundling up further in the, in the bad weather. The one piece of equipment that was missing, though, was a parachute. The pilots were leery and did not trust this new technology with many pilots opting to take their chances with going down 
with their plane than relying on a piece of silk. And a lot of times, uh, the higher ups would not give them a parachute because they figured they might jump out of the plane when they could actually crash land that plane and recover it for parts later. So, living conditions for the uh, pilot was much better than those of the fighting on the ground. They suffered in the li in living in the muck and the, and the vermin. The pilots also kept close to the front. They were building it usually in tents and nearby farmhouses in the villages. Uh, the following is a description from a series of articles written by uh, Don Nix titled The History of the Air Services in Canada. Life in the Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service was not a bed of roses for the glamorous flyboys as depicted in the movie The Dawn Patrol. There were many hardships. A typical air station on the Western Front consisted of an open field, which was your airstrip, canvas hangers, officer's mess, which is normally only uh, uh, the only construction around, probably, and living quarters generally under canvas. More often than not, there, there would be a squadron using the same open field, but established on the opposite side of the grassy runway. Flying continued 28, uh, throughout the, uh, the extreme summer heat with its dust and sweat, and in the winter during the rains, creating quagmires, they took off and landed in the mud. There was not, nothing was paved. And in the cold of November to February, dysentery, fever, nerves, stomach problems were all commonplace in the air services, and life expectancy for a new pilot in 1918 had de decreased to a few days. His squadron, the 23 squadron, remained in service until, uh, until the war and was disbanded in uh, 1919. In that squadron, in a total of 19 aces, that's so somebody that shot down more than five planes. Uh, among, among its ranks, Harold Albert White was an ace, and American pilot James William Peterson, who achieved 12 victories, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross also. So it's an American getting a Commonwealth Award. The squadron proved that it lived up to its motto, Semper, aggressive, always on the attack. And like I said, uh, Harold White is credited with seven victories of enemy aircraft from June to September 1918 as a member of the squadron. So uh, this is one of those planes that he would have shot down. Uh, an average pilot's day was a mission in the morning then back, to, back for lunch, followed by another mission in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, they'd go to the mess, have a few drinks, and then repeat it all over again the next day. So it, uh, it was real easy to uh, drink your problems away. Right. Just to confirm, uh, you said uh, he had seven um, confirmed... Uh, is, yes. it not, is it not true that they might have actually um, down more than that? Yeah. That it's, it's just that they weren't necessarily able to be confirmed. So, uh, um, seven confirmed was actually quite an accomplishment because he might have actually down a dozen planes. Absolutely, and sometimes they share because, uh, you know, two pilots would get shots in and you don't know the one that was actually responsible for the plane going down. So, okay. How far would they go on these missions? Approximately. Well, everything took place in France and Belgium. Yeah. So, and, and in France and Belgium, the battlefield is like Grant County and and Hollywood. You know, that's that's France and Belgium. They're so close. The entire First World War took place in in such a small area that it, it's you look at some of the maps of where the cemeteries are, and there's thousands of cemeteries all over the place. But they would not have gone far. Yeah. Uh, up until November 1917, uh, this squadron, Squadron 23, was flying the SPAD D D8. Now, that was built in December, but it had been replaced by the more powerful and, he and heavier armed SPAD S. Um, these are just two of the planes: the SPAD and the, uh, the and the uh, SPAD, the SPAD versions of the SPAD. After deployment. And upon arrival in France, Harold Albert was shocked to discover that the squadron was still flying the SPAD S-8. But in April 1918, the squadron had converted over to the Sopwith Dolphin. Now the Sopwith Dolphin, this is another one of those pictures that was a really 
ratty old picture that Julia worked on and got it enhanced and then colorized it. And this and it just it does give you a different perspective on the uh, on the on the planes at the time. The soft with Dolphin had a crew of one and was armed with two Vickers machine guns. And we've got a Vickers, over in the World War I area, if you want to wander around later, there's a Vickers machine gun over there. So you can see it's an open cockpit. Uh, there's, there's your machine gun up on top, and there's one set down. Uh, they're set side by side. And he would operate that from the control panel in the cockpit. And uh, it's designed uh, to surpass other fighter planes uh, it's back staggered single seat that provided the pilot with excellent visibility from the cockpit. <laughs> it's popular with pilots during the German offensive in 1918 in the time when Harold was flying. Dolphins conducted ground attack operations, bombing as well as machine gunning enemy troop concentrations. So they were, and they didn't fly very fast, so they were a good target. Because when they're coming in on somebody to, to strafe them, the, the people on the ground can still have a shot at them. And that's reflected in the story about, uh, you know, the Red Baron. The Red Baron was, was thought to be taken down by a Canadian, but uh, it, it's been probably proven that an Australian infantryman, a shot from an infield rifle, took down the Red Baron from the ground. According to research completed by uh, Norman Frankson, published in his book, Dolphin, and snipe aces of World War I. The following combat report was filed by Harold Albert on September 16, 1918, following an offensive patrol and escort mission flown at 0830 hours for RAF bombers near uh, San Quentin. He had already claimed one aircraft out of control with another pilot by the time the particular action took place. And this is the words of, uh, of Harold White. While on offensive patrol, I was leading the lower formation when we were attacked by a formation of about seven enemy aircraft. They call them EAs, the enemy aircraft. The general engagement followed in which I singled out one and chased him down to about 7,000 feet, firing three or four bursts from 50 to 25 yard range. That's really close for, for, for where they are compared to now. After the last burst, the enemy aircraft who had been uh, S-turning to avoid my fire went into a vertical dive. Almost immediately a burst of black smoke came from the uh, Fokker, which was the type of plane that he shot down, and, uh, and increased rapidly in quantity, emitting clouds of black smoke. So this was, it's, uh, it, it gets very personal up there because you're actually, you're, you're, you're not only just killing the enemy, you're, you're killing him and watching him go down, so. Brian. Um, on the machine gun, where would the ammunition be stored? Because, uh, and, and how much ammunition would they have? Because they probably have to be controlling that to some extent. Well, he could, he could reach up because that gun would come down on a, on a little uh, on a cable. Okay. And on top was a drum. Okay. That he would just pop the other one off and throw it overboard and then just put a new one on. And that drum contained, you know, a, 50 to 75 rounds that was in the drum. He just put that right on top, which, yeah, right on, yeah, right on, almost there. And, and get back in action. And they did not fire an awful lot. It was just do, 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 and the machine guns back then were, were slow firing and in small caliber. You know, there's the same caliber as they fired in the, in the rifles, the, the infantry. Thank you. So although Germany had surrendered in November of uh, 1918, the trauma of war and its effect did not stop. In February of 1919, it's reported in the Brantford Expositor that Captain Harold Albert White was suffering from flying sickness. The following was published in the paper. Captain Harold Albert White suffering from flying sickness. Words received yesterday that Captain Harold White, Harold Alfred White, Albert White, of the Royal Air Force has been transferred from France to Prince of Wales Hospital, London, suffering from flying sickness. Captain Harold White formerly resided at uh, 546 Coleman Street in this city. So this was one of the, the symptoms that you know early flyers and pilots and aviators suffered from, from the G-force and the flying and 
just, just the lifestyle of the pilot. It was a real strain on the body. So little was known about this, uh, the impact of war on men in the early studies of how flying affected aviators. The medical profession at that time deemed flying sickness attributed to differences in air pressure and temperature, and that led to headaches, pounding ears, and breathing difficulties. And many suffered from fatigue or sleeping disorders and uh, general malaise, and a flyer over, over, could overcome these, by these symptoms would eventually suffer a complete mental and physical collapse. Today it would be probably classed as post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD and it was a sickness uh, that sent them back to uh, England for rest and recovery in hospitals or converted country estates and a lot of times some of these guys did not recover and others they try to get them back because of an aviator's a valuable commodity at that time. So, uh, Harold was eventually discharged sometime in late February and returned to Canada, arriving in Halifax Port in March of 1919. At this point, he's 23 years of age and listed as a captain on the ship's manifest. He returned to his family's home at 546 Colbert Street, and shortly after his return home, the following notice was published in the London Gazette, London, uh, London Gazette 31378. Date May 30, 1919, and the honor of award, Distinguished Flying Cross, named Harold Ever White, Lieutenant. Captain Harold Ever White received Distinguished Flying Cross, first local airman to win highly decorated flying decoration. So he's the first Brentford, Brett County area person to win this uh, prestigious award, and it's an award for valor. Uh, so they received notice uh, from the Air Ministry that this was going to be, uh, this was for service in France and he would be uh, awarded this. Now in October of 1919, uh, the Bradford Expositor published an article stating that the Prince heir to the throne, the Prince of Wales, later to be king and then advocated, was coming to Bradford to present the decorations to local, local officers and men. Uh, Captain Harold Albert White was listed as receiving the Distinguished Flying Cross at that point. The White family had attended First Baptist Church in, in Brantford, and following the end of World War I, the church hung a roll of honor of uh, congre congregational men and women, men who had served during the war. And it's just like some of these plaques that are on the wall here. All the churches, all the businesses, they all honored their, their service people that went overseas. And then uh, when they came back, they could see that they had been honored, the ones that were lost. And a lot of these things are a work of art and are done by hand. They're all done by hand, uh, whether it's paint or whether it's uh, engraved in wood. There's so many churches now <coughs> excuse me, that the congregations are getting smaller and the churches are closing. And we are very fortunate to be receiving, whether it's St. John's uh, Church from West Branch or, or St. Luke's or or we've got a, a, a pulpit from a church that would have been destroyed when the churches were, were uh, turned over to apartments or condos or something else. But we are the proud recipients of those and they, they've got a place of honor in this building. Um, his, his brothers uh, also served in the military and they were also named on, on the, uh, the honor roll at that church. The legacy of the First War of Flyers cannot be underestimated. With the horror of the ground board, the exploits of pilots, and they were also known as Knights of the Air, were used to boost morale at home. They were sort of the rock stars of their day, and Harold White was one of those stars. He was one of the lucky ones to re home, return home from the war, but it's unlikely that he did not, did not return without scars, both physically and emotionally. He was a strong man, and managed to move forward as he slowly settled back into civilian life and entered his next chapter. So in 1919, the war's been over for, for a year. Following the return from the war front, Harold did not return to work with his former employee, which was uh, Kerr and Goodman. And as, as uh, was common with many returning airmen, barnstorming was a profession of choice, and he was no exception. He took up this traveling entertainment show to 
to earn an income. And according to family, Harold Albert was described as a rascal, a daring young man who was known for walking on airplane wings while they were flying. So a lot of people did this. Barnstorming was not an easy profession. And in order to attract attention, pilot would fly over town and then land in a nearby field where he would offer fancy flights, ordinary flights, or just put on a show of stunt flying. And a lot of times there were, there, there were casualties in this. It was a tough life, and most pilots had to maintain a secondary job just to keep this up and make ends meet. And it was not uncommon for them to uh, work as mechanics or gas station attendants or flying instructor. But due to the Canadian weather, pilots had a limited period. Uh, and any financial benefit from flying, and especially uh, usually op uh, operated from spring until the end of harvest, and the country fairs. He engaged in this occupation around Ontario, and it's believed that uh, during one of his stops, he met his soon-to-be wife, Myrtle White. And there's a picture coming up. Yes. That, that's a colorized picture. The, the old black and white picture, uh, this did not do justice to the beauty of this woman that was to be Harold's wife. Uh, there was a courtship and engagement period. Um, Harold uh, purchased a uh, marriage license in St. Thomas. And they were married in Elmer, Ontario, which is uh, the tradition back then was to get married in the church of the bride. And uh, he was 24 years of age at this time and enlisted the occupation uh, as aviator. And she was a little older. She was 33 years of age. So Harold was uh, lacking a higher level of education. He had a, a, a high intellect. He was basically a self-taught man. He valued education and always encouraged his son and grandchildren to pursue education and knowledge. He was deeply knowledgeable about religion, perhaps from his upbringing, but had a little time for church, attending services and weddings and funerals, just about, that's all he did. He held many occupations throughout his life, initially as a machinist, but also embraced Myrtle's family business in grist mills and sawmills. In the 1920s, he purchased a farm where he became interested in genetic crossbreeding of seeds and the development of new crops. So, I mean, this is a man of <coughs> different talents. He was an excellent craftsman and millwork machinist and tackled his work with the intent to be successful and where possible, make improvements. His work ethic was such that he believed that you started a task, you continue through until its completion. It's even said that in recognition of his vast knowledge and understanding, he was, visit he was a visiting lecturer at the University of London, speaking on philosophy, <laughs> philosophy and politics. So as a uh, well-honed machinist, and he operated his own garage, machine shop business for many years in Aylmer, and he's also known as a maker of fine spindle furniture. And during the war years of World War II, he was now too old to enlist, and he produced parts for machine guns, such as uh, part of the con contribution to the war effort. And he was an avid fisherman and enjoyed every opportunity to uh, cast a rod and take, his, and take to a stream. In the early days, he enjoyed the thrill of riding his Indian motorcycle. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was actually a person who could be described as a man who thought outside the box, a man who would pursue ideas to improve efficiencies of the, or the, of the quality of daily life. On, our, on February 13, 1946, Harold, having envisioned a better design, filed a patent application to the United States Patent Office for a new and improved bottle opener. And his design was assigned serial number 647234, and his objective was to provide a bottle opener that was neat, compact, durable, and be easy to carry a personal gadget like that near like a common pocket knife. Two years later, in 1948, his design was registered in the official gazette and patented by the United States Patent Office. Um, there was a man who never stood still. And when he was not working, he would spend hours in the home workshop creating personal items such as a vase made from a cannon 
and a brass replica of a soft red dolphin his beloved plane that he flew in World War I. Captain Harold Wright was a man who passed through life with little acknowledgments to his World War I achievements or being a recipient of the distinguished flying cross. The flying cross was awarded to officers and warrant officers for acts of, of valor, courage, and devotion to duty in the face of the enemy. Only, like I said, only 193 DFCs were awarded to Canadians in World War I, and Captain Harold Albert White was one of them. From a military standpoint, uh, Harold's accomplishments were unknown to the public. Family members were aware of his achievements, but few others. And, and some of these are the words of, of Julia in her, uh, her, her genealogical book. Harold's life story is a reminder that everyone has a great story to tell. Unfortunately, for the most few are ever told. And during World War I, those 193 Canadians who received the Distinguished Flying Cross should have been recognized. And how many stories were never told, were never heard. For this one World War I pilot, his life and accomplishments will not be forgotten. And perhaps as time goes on, more pilots like Harold will have their tale told. So in some of these pictures, and there's, there's the three of each, and, it, and it's the original, the enhanced, and the colorized. And this is uh, Harold as an officer. <clears throat> and you have to remember, these pictures are over 100 years old. So the quality <coughs> is, uh, it's amazing that they've, they've just survived with the uh, photography. That's him as, the, uh, as a lieutenant uh, cadet. And this is the picture of Harold as a young boy with his sister Emily. And he died on Friday, December 24th, 1971. And he's buried in Elmer with his first wife, Murphy, and his daughter, Alta Dilby. <coughs> so the life of Harold Albert has been one of enduring and, and an overbearing, strict, sometimes abusive father who spent fewer years with his family than he did with various congregations to a personal and private life of love while facing and coping with great losses. He was not a large man in stature, but a giant of a man in life. He suffered from illness, emphysema, and the loss of a lung, which everybody, everybody in the first war smoked. I mean, they sent you cigarettes as a favor while you were over there. And he uh, uh, always felt the strength to move forward and embrace them all the best he could. They say that everyone has a story to tell. Harold Albert White was a man of many seasons with a story to be told. His, his life story is much more than could be mentioned here in uh, such a short time today. As Harold Albert White is the son of a Baptist minister, he's a Brantford boy, and he's a recipient of the Stainless Flying Cross. Thank you.